thank you so much to everyone who's joining us, who's coming on in, um, and welcome to the Voices of Legacy Awards, um, part one. Um, my name is Lauren K. Elaine. I am the executive director of the Fierce Flower Poetry Center at James Madison University, and I'm a poet, and most importantly tonight, I am a fan and we are about to hear some amazing readings by some of this year's legacy award nominees um, and it's my pleasure to introduce them all to you um, they will read from their work for around eight minutes we'll have a brief uh, q a with me i get to ask all the questions tonight and um and then we will say good night so that's the run of show um i do want to let you know that tomorrow there is another the part two of tonight's of the voices of legacy award event and on thursday is the final ceremony so please check the event bright which has the schedule and links uh rsvp get your life get your tickets all that good stuff um, because I want to maximize the time we have to hear from tonight's nominees, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in and introduce them to you. Uh, Shar McCollum, whose book No Ruined Stone is the nomination tonight, um, she, from Jamaica and born to a Jamaican father and Venezuelan mother, Shar McCollum is the author of six books of poetry published in the U.S. and the U.K., most recently No Ruined Stone. It's a finalist as well, not only for the, a nomination for this award, the Herson Reich Legacy Foundation, Foundation Legacy Award, but also the 2022 UNT Rilke Prize. McCallum's poems and essays have appeared in journals, anthologies, and textbooks throughout the US, Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. La Historia es un cuarto, History is a Room, an anthology of poems drawn from her six books and translated into Spanish by Al. Adalbert Salas Hernandez was published in 2021. In addition to Spanish, her poems have been translated into French, Italian, Romanian, Turkish, and Dutch. But tonight she will be reading in English. Awards for her work include the Silver Musgrave Medal from the Jamaican government, the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Poetry, Award of Binder Fellowship from the U.S. Library of Congress, and any in poetry, among many, many others. McCallum delivers readings, lectures, and workshops around the world. In fact, she's taken off for the UK next week, she just told us. She's taught creative writing and literature at several universities and is currently an Edwin Earls Parks professor at Penn State University and a faculty member in the Pacific University Low Res MFA program. Um, she was also, from 2021 to 22, the Penn State Laureate. Next is Terry Ellen David Cross Davis um, for A More Perfect Union. It's her collection of poetry. Terry Ellen Cross Davis is the author of A More Perfect Union, 2019 winner of the journal Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize, and of Haint, which won the 2017 Ohioana Book Award for Poetry. She's a 2022 state awardee of the Maryland State Arts Council Individual Artists Award and received the Poetry Society of America's 2020 Robert H. Winner Memorial Prize. She's a recipient of grants from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and the Freya Project, a member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective, which is always sounds so much fun. She has been awarded fellowships and scholarships to Kaveh Kanam, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Hedgebrook, Community of Writers Poetry Workshop, among others. Her work has appeared in many journals and anthologies, including the Harvard Review, Pink, Poetry Ireland, and others. Um, this one is fun to say. She was a 2019-2020 Hoko Polizzo writer in residence for Howard County, Maryland, and is the current O.B. Hardison Poetry Series Curator and Poetry Programs Manager for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. She lives in Maryland with her husband, also a poet, Hayes Davis, and their kids. Yusuf Kumanyaka, uh, who's new and selected everyday mojo songs of earth, has numerous collections of poetry, which include Dean Kai Dao, which won the Dark Room Poetry Prize, Thieves of Paradise, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Neon Vernacular, for which he received both the Pulitzer and the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, War Horses, The Chameleon Couch, 
finalist for the National Book Award, among many, many others. He served as New York's 11th State Poet Laureate and is a recipient of the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Wallace Stevens Award, the 2021 Griffin Lifetime Poetry Lifetime Recognition Award, and the Lannan Foundation Lannan Literary Award for Lifetime Achievement. His plays, performance art, and libretti include Gilgamesh, A Verse Play, Testimony, Endangered, and Wakanda's Dream, and have been performed nationally and internationally. Natasha Deon is a two-time NAACP Image Award nominee for Outstanding Literature, practicing criminal attorney, and author of the critically acclaimed and widely reviewed novels, The Perishing and Grace, and was named a best book by the New York Times, Oh, Grace was named a Best Book by the New York Times and awarded Best Debut Novel by the Library Association's Black Caucus. I'm not telling my mom that she's a lawyer and a poet and a writer because I'm just going to get in trouble. A Penn Fellow, um, Dion has also been awarded fellowships and residencies at Yale, Prague's Creative Writing Program, Dickinson House in Belgium, and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. She's a professor of creative writing at Yale, UCLA, and Antioch University. Her personal essays have been featured in the New York Times, Harper's, the Los Angeles Times, Harper's Bazaar, American Short Fiction, BuzzFeed, and others. Y'all see, we have a powerhouse lineup tonight. So please enjoy, and first up, Shara. Good evening, everyone. Lauren, thank you so much. I would um, spend all my eight minutes singing the praises of everybody in this room. Uh, I do have to really say what an honor it is for me to be um, among this year's honorees, and especially with Yusef Kumunyaka. Um, I read your poems before I even had glimmerings of myself as a poet. I remember when I first read Neon Vernacular, uh, it blew the top off my head and everything since. So this is a great honor. Um, also a shout out to my sister, Terry Cross Davis. We go way back to 1997, Kaveh Kanem and Natasha, such a delight. Thank you. I'm just gonna read a couple poems, maybe a couple in the loose term. Um, from No Ruined Stone. I'm going to begin with the first poem. Um, for those who I think haven't um, seen the book or heard about it, I'm sure you're just coming here to find out about new things. I'll just say that this book is an alternate account of history. It is a speculative account based on the true life of the 18th century poet Robert Burns. As it turns out, Burns almost went to Jamaica to work on a slave plantation. This is something that uh, did not match up with the idea of Burns I had in my head as a young person who loved his poetry. And um, out of that provocation came this book. This first poem is me speaking to Burns. No Ruined Stone. You saturate the sight of those who come after poets and painters alike. Your words, Invade my mind's listening. Manacle my tongue when I try to speak. On all, I backward cast my eye and fear and cannot see. Who would I have been to you? What stone in the ruined house of the past? In this world, I am on loose, belonging to no country, no tribe, no clan, not African, not Scotland. And you, voice that stalks my waking and dreaming, you more myth than man, cannot unmake history. So why am I here resurrecting you to speak when your silence gulfs centuries? Why do I find myself on your doorstep knocking when I know the dead will never answer? So after I give that dare to myself as a poet, the opening poem in the book, I go ahead and I resurrect the dead. 
The first half of this book is voiced in none other than the man himself, Robert Burns. Many things happen, but I transplant him to Jamaica and have him live out the last 10 years of his life there from 1786 to 96. When the second half of the book opens, the speaker is Isabella. She's his granddaughter. She is a black woman born into slavery and she looks white. All of these things come to light in the collection, but because I'm again trying to give a little context for this, I'm offering some of the narrative backstory here. Um, before I read this point, what I wanna also just mention is Isabella's grandmother, Nancy, is an enslaved African woman with whom Burns has a multi-year relationship. Um, and she is really who rescues Isabella. Her ingenuity um, is what allows them to escape slavery. Um, and this memory that Isabella is speaking of here, because this is Isabella, she bears a striking resemblance to Shara, I understand, but this is in fact a 19th century um, mulatta speaking. Um, the memory she's speaking of is not just her own crossing as it is from Jamaica to Scotland, but is also the memory of her grandmother's crossing on the Middle Passage. Memory. My first was sound brought forth from her hands, wielding an ax, severing the necks of fowl, rending flesh from bone, that sound, torn from a throat, the cry she'd made as a child rendered orphan, stolen across an ocean, hungering to feed, ceaselessly to feed. The second was no sound, but fire kindled of her hands, lighting kitchen walls, dredging blood from the sea's memory, blood tilling soil, blood not even rain that falls and falls without end, not any water we cross, any riverbed stone, can absolve. Nancy is really the love of Isabella's life. Um, and one of the things that happened to Isabella is that when she dies, um, in the wake of her death, Isabella finds herself really asking the question if she can bear to continue to pass. It is what has saved her from slavery and has saved her life but it is also an erasure of her grandmother and of the trail of her ancestors that she is reckoning with. And um, her grandmother comes to her in dream at one point in her narrative, and this is her grandmother, Nancy, speaking to her. At the hour of guppy and dream, Miss Nancy speaks. You think what lies before you asks more than you can bear but I am with you now as I was when you came into this world, your one eye looking forward, your other forever looking back. From the netherworld, you were flung into this one, squalling full of that scent we could not wash away. Your mother's breath, extinguished as you gulped your first, the call swaddling your face, till we lifted it, unveiling, beholding the unasked for, girl child cast down in a place of stone, of men who cannot see to see, do not hear what needs listening, men who have riven borders and nations, and you in whom the rift has opened. Hear me, for I was there in the beginning, witness as you entered, as you came dusking, tearing all asunder, rending the fabric they call truth. And I will close with the last poem in the book, 
which is also the title of the collection. It's No Ruined Stone and it's dedicated to my grandmother. It is also for all my ancestors. When the dead return, they will come to you in dream and in waking will be the bird knocking, knocking against glass, seeking a way in, will masquerade as the wind, its voice made audible by the tongues of leaves, greedily lapping as the waves, self-made fugue is a turning and returning. The dead will not then nor ever again desert you. Their unrest will be the coat cloaking you. The farther you journey from them, the more distance will maw in you. Time and place gulching when the dead return to demand accounting. Wanting and wanting and wanting everything you have to give and nothing will quench or unhunger them as they take all you make as offering, then tell you to begin again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shara. Um, I get the honor of asking you a couple of questions. I'm gonna start with an easy one. How long did this book take you to write? So the book um, was based out of that question that I mentioned at the beginning. It took three years of research for me to work up the courage to write this book. It was a very daunting endeavor. Natasha, you are an actual proper novelist. I'm a poet who decided to ask poetry to do the work of the novel. And so I think that research was really um, me girding my loins in a way. Um, <laughs> and so, and also taking on this kind of a history, which deals not just with the legacy of a man like Burns, but also slavery, miscegenation, rape, um, very difficult topics to, to really want to, want to wade into. I felt I needed armament for it. Um, and then the writing, I suppose, happened faster. Actually, after all those years of research and note taking, I wrote the first third of this book in about 12 days. And then I wrote it in several other stints like that over about a year period. Wow. And so I have so many questions, but we have limited time. Of course. Uh, tell me about the process of research. And um, what are some of the, the most interesting places your research took you? And what are some of the most surprising things you discovered in doing that research? Yeah. So, you know, I'll just give one story because I have so many, but the archives were some of the most fruitful for me. I reread everything that Robert Burns had ever written, including all of his prose, but actually going to the archives and holding the manuscript in his hand and seeing that handwriting was a kind of imaginative trigger for me um, that really helped me to think I could actually step back in time. Um, but the other one that was also very, very instructive was being in Jamaica, which is where I'm from. But you know, just by virtue of being Jamaican does not make me an expert in 18th century plantation slavery, right? So I really went to Jamaica to look at the land now to try to read back the, pre you know, the past. Um, and I went to the archives and I am sure many people have had this experience, but I had never had it. I held a bill of sale in my hand for the first time. And I left, I had to actually leave the archives. I was, I was so really overcome. And I remember standing on the street in Kingston and I really think that that's where Nancy was born. Mm -hmm. So some of the figures in this book are wedded to historical figures and are real people I have reimagined others Nancy, Isabella, you know, the Black women in this book, basically, they're the ones that are imagined, but based on real women who I know would have existed. So just a couple ways in which I really can't say enough for archival research, um, as much as reading books. And there's your train, Lauren, right? There's the train. train. So I think this is a good time for me to <laughs> shut up and we can hear more poems. 
<laughs> okay, next up is Terry. Okay. Well, I just have to say all of what what was said before. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you, Hurston Wright. Um, and it's an honor, it's a privilege, it's a joy to read with this group of illustrious poets. So I'll just jump right in and start off with this poem. A black woman gets a window seat on Aer Lingus. Aer Lingus is the major airline in and out of Ireland. Enough Ireland. For all your lush effusion of color, inside me blooms a masochistic loneliness. Give me the screws I know best. The policemen quick to test my yes sir as assetless trigger the Midwest. Never on the Bible school test was this. Crucifixion kills, not nails into feet or wrist, but the weight borne upon the breast. You suffocate slowly in your own flesh. As I return to the upright cross of the US, I breathe easier, I breathe less. Um, and so in this collection, I created my own goddesses. Why not? Uh, and, and as a person who grew up loving and reading comic books and loving and reading mythology, you know, Greek mythology was a gateway drug and then there was Roman, then there was Norse, and then there was Egyptian. And so why not create a voice full of that power? And so here are one of the goddesses that I created. This is the goddess of scars. I mark you with melanin, a cross hatch of collagen. Better the scar than the loss of limb. Better the clean line, raised itch, festering wound, beckoning death. My apostles, my keloids, my atrophic, my contractures, my hypertrophic response. Each a love I bear to the mammal of you, the ruptured vessel, the broken in dermis. Consider my evolution a song to survival. Consider cells, my priest, their work a ladder of prayer, each stitch an epistle. I agree to see you separate from yourself. My atonement is a bridge to build you back together. While you can never be born again, you can recover. Each time I assign you, witness the parable of action and consequence. I do not think you show enough reverence. You were never meant to be a smooth canvas, but a texture, a testament. I bless you with a story, and each and every time you live to tell the tale. Um, so I am a mom of two and my youngest, uh, August Ellison is 11, taller than I am, no big feet, I'm not the tallest person. But um, this poem came from my interactions with him, very inquisitive, curious child. Partis sequitur ventrum. And partis sequitur ventrum is a Latin phrase that stands for the principle that the children of an enslaved woman are themselves born as slaves and owned by their mother's master. One, mourning. His knobby six-year-old knees, his anxious pace as if to keep step with the question steady overflow. Is there a giant octopus in the Bermuda Triangle? How is paper made? How do fireworks know when to explode? No one told me black boys could burn so bright. Wait, I am wrong. The dark sky has seen their fire snuffed by white hoods, malevolent blue eyes and bluer uniforms, white women's screams, all have been matched to their tender wood. So I hug my son tight, kiss the curl cropped so close it's straight. My mother, I insatiable. He is dessert and I'll always have seconds. Each morning I lick my thumb, clean him up good, wishing in vain the amniotic sac had dried to armor. Two, night. His lisp, loose, syrupy sweet, sneaks into my ear. Feel its heat, small source, more flicker than flame, flanked by arms still dreaming of muscle. He claims my squishy stomach the best pillow. 
If the security of our locked arms could extend beyond growth spurts, clocks, calendars, to the someone interviewing him, to the someone following him in the store, to the someone holding my son's life in trembling fingers poised above a phone's keypads. Let my love be a note safety pin to his chest. Send him back alive, unharmed. As a black mother in America, I know my whales are birthright, pinned with iron, pinned in ink. And I'll end with this poem, which is a favorite of my mother. And not, I think, because she's in this poem, um, but I think it speaks to a lot of the things um, that she's tried to teach me. And this is called, uh, Thank You, Jesus. When the blue and red sirens pass you, when the school calls because your child beat the exam and not a classmate, when the smartphone drops but does not crack, the rush escaping your mouth betrays your upbringing. Thank you, Jesus, a balm over the wound. When the mammogram finds only density, when the playground tumble results in a bruise, not a broken bone, like steam from a hot tea kettle, thank you, Jesus, and the pent up fear bends upward out. Maybe it's a hand over breast, supplication learned deeper than flesh, as if one could shush the soul, the fluttering heartbeat with three words. Maybe it's not so dire, an almost trip on the sidewalk, the accumulated sales total showing savings upon savings. Maybe it's as small as an empty seat on the Metro, or maybe, thank you, Jesus, becomes the refrain every time your husband pulls into the driveway alive and whole and no one has mistaken him for all the black scary things. You mutter it, helpless to stop yourself from the invocation of your grandmother who gave you your first Bible. You say it because your mother, even knowing your doubt as a vested commodity, still urges prayer. You learned early to cast the net. Thank you, Jesus. And it's a sweet needle that gathers the fraying thread, hemming security in steady stitches. From birth, you've heard this language. As an adult, you've seen religion used nakedly as ambition, yet this sacrifice of praise still slips past your lips, this lyrical martyr of your dying faith. Thank you. And again, what an honor to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Terry Allen Cross Davis. Um, so, so much in this collection, but I am so interested always in the craft of what it means to stitch the personal and the political so closely together. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like you do it so eloquently. Uh, what are some craft poetry -y things that you lean on to help you make those connections so tight? Well, one thing is, is because I was a congressional page and I moved to DC when I was 16 and worked um, in the Capitol building, went to school, then the Library of Congress, I have a tendency and an inclination to reread a lot of our founding documents. Mm -hmm. and, and so I let the passion and the kind of knowledge of those documents and that language influence so much of what I think and feel and write about here. So if it's just taking, you know, looking at syntax, looking at diction, looking at all those things and thinking, how can I find a way to acknowledge that this is like the linguistic history of our democracy, but also I have to tell my truth. And that is, how do I see and view and feel and live this through my lens as a black woman in this country? So those two things have been married all my life. For, I mean, I would read, you know, the Declaration of Independence and tear up because I was so inspired by it, you know. Um, but then as I got older, I just, I had issues, uh, yeah. you know. And so I had, to, I had to lay claim and honor that truth and say, okay, well, you know, you're going to hear it. And that's, that's, that's how I blended because I'm always talking back to history. Oh, thank you for that. Um, a more perfect union is such a provocative title for the collection but i am curious about your journey towards the more perfect poem that's a process question how do you what's your how do you move the poems towards the more perfect version of themselves 
Well, I have been um, really grateful to be in a workshop with some incredible poets for, I had to think about how old my daughter is, uh, 13 years. Um, they actually saw me pregnant, nursing, <laughs> everything all throughout the time. And I'm still in that workshop group. So a lot of times I'm eager to share work with them and get their feedback. And then it's a lovely thing to be married to a poet because he's also my first reader. Uh, so um, I get a lot of feedback from family, from friends, and from my job as uh, the, the poetry curator for the Folger Shakespeare Library. Um, so in, in this way, all these voices become a conversation that is constantly going on in my head. And it's just a matter of when can I be silent enough to hear all these voices and make them work and figure out what they're trying to say and what I need to say in response. And that's that's what helps me narrow down the poem and edit it down and revise it because I, I need to hear clearly so I can speak clearly. Ooh, and how do you know when it's done? That's a tough one. There are times I go back through my first book and I still want to edit those poems and I'm like, this is wasted energy. Um, so, so it's tough. I think there comes a time when I have to just let it go. And when I realize I can't say anything more and it, to say anything more is to change the poem fundamentally. And maybe that's not where that poem needs to go. And maybe you just need to write something else, Terry. And so as you can tell, these are conversations I have with myself. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough when to let a poem go, but, um, I try and just, once I feel like I've gotten the rhythm of it, I've gotten the the music, I've gotten uh, the language and the voice of it on the page, I, I have to honor what's there and, and not tinker with it and take it apart. Thank you so much. I'm gonna bring on our next reader, uh, Yusuf Kouanyaka. It is a privilege uh, to read with some these amazing poets. And uh, I'm going to jump right in here. Um, when eyes are on me, I'm a scrappy old line who's wandered into a Christian square, quavering with centers of forged bells. The cobblestones make my feet ache. I walk big shoulder, my head raised proudly. I smell the blood of a king. The citizens can see only a minotaur in a maze. I know more than a line should know. My roar goes back to the Serengeti. The wind, a savanna was craggy ice, but now it frightens only pigeons from a city stoop. They believe they know my brain's contours and grammar. Don't ask me how I know the signs engraved on a sundial, the secret icons behind a gaze. I wish their crimes hadn't followed me here. I can hear their applause in the dusty citadel i know what it took to master the serpent and will the crossbow and spinal tap once i was a leopard beside a stone gate i am a riddle to be unraveled i am not and i am when their eyes are on me I become whatever is judged badly. I circle the park. Hunger shakes my keen sense of smell. A lifetime ahead. They will follow my paw prints till they're lost in snow and dust. If I walk in circles, I hide from my shadow. They plot stars to know where to find me. I am a prodigal bird perched on the peak of a god house. I have a message for faith. The sunlight has shown me the guns and their beautiful sons are deadly.
on the second poem, Blue Dementia. In the days when a man could hold a swarm of words inside his belly, nestled against his spleen, singing. In the days of night riders, when life hung to read till blues and sorrow song call out of the deep night, another man done gone, another man done gone. In the days when one could lose oneself all up inside love that way and then moan on the bone till the gods cried out in someone's sleep. Today, already, I've seen three dark-skinned men discussing the weather with demons and angels, gazing up at the clouds, squinting down into iron grapes along the fast streets of luminous encounters. I double-check my reflection in plate glass and wonder, am I passing another Lucky Thomason? a Marin Brown haunted by a blue dementia, another dark-skinned man who woke up dreaming one morning and then walked out of himself dreaming? Did this one dare to step on a crack in a sidewalk, to turn a midnight corner and never come back whole? Or did he try to stare down a look that shoved a blade into his heart? I mean, I also know something about night riders and cat gut. Yeah, honey, I know something about talking with ghosts. And the third and last poem I'm reading is a prose poem. Grenade. There's no rehearsal to turn flesh into dust so quickly. A hair trigger, a cock hammer in the brain, a split second between man and infamy. It lands on the ground, a few soldiers duck, and the others are caught in a half gun, and one throws himself down on the grenade. All the watches stop, a flash, Smoke, silence, the sound fills the whole day. Flush and earth fall into the eyes and mouths of the men, a dream trap in midair. They touch their legs and arms, their groins, ears and noses, saying, what happened? Some are crying, others are laughing. Some are almost dancing. Someone tries to put the dead man back together. He just dove on the damn thing, sir. A flash, smoke, silence, the day blown apart. For those who can walk away, where is their burden? Shreds of flesh and bloody rags gather up and stuff into a bag. Each breath belongs to him, each song, each curse. Every prayer is his. Your body doesn't belong to your mind and soul. Who are you? Do you remember the man left in the jungle? The others who owe their lives to this phantom. Do they feel like you? Would his loved ones remember him if that park or stature erected in his name didn't exist? And does it enlarge their lives? You wish. He'd lie down in that closed coffin and not wander the streets or enter your bedroom at midnight. The woman you love, she'd never understand who would. You remember what he used to say, if you give a kite too much strain, it'll break free. That unselfish certainty. But you can't remember when you began to live his unspoken dreams.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Yusuf. It's just always such a pleasure and joy to hear you read. And um, one of my questions for you is about the, this is a new and selected, you know, yes. and you've done new and selected. So what, what is, how is that process different every time you do it? And what does it feel like to see these poems from, you know, a decade ago, a couple of decades I, ago? What's I know what you mean, yes. to them? Yeah. This is a secondary new and selected from 2001 to 2021 mm -hmm. with fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. And I'm curious about about what what poetry still gives after after this long in the game, so to speak, yes. uh, in the practice, um, what what still surprises you in writing? What still gives you joy in writing a poem? What's still hard? <laughs> What's so hard is um, to trust one's voice over such a long period of time, mm -hmm. and yet, let's face it. Um, my um i feel that the reader or the listener is co-creator of meaning and i still trust that so i'm i i will my poems to the world hoping that others you know bring me to the necessary truth in the poem mm. so uh leaving room in the poem is uh is, is is an act of faith in some ways right that that the reader yes. sort of, of brings it home and so again i sort of um go back and when you read yourself as a younger poet when you read your early works as the reader what do you want to say to that poet of 20 years, 40 years ago yeah <laughs> <laughs> well um it is often very surprising because I do find myself revising sometimes mm -hmm. the younger voice. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, often we want to tell everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that silence, that there's, you can trust the reader to make those leaps. So you're going back to tell uh, early Yusuf, don't don't say as much. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I have. That's what I argue with. Yes. Thank you so much, and we'll thank you, Yusuf, and our final reader tonight, uh, Natasha. Welcome on. Hello. I am so excited to be here. I'm in Los Angeles where it's still the afternoon. My husband just went to pick up my, my children from school. So I am just honored to be here. I'm gonna be reading from my novel, which is called The Perishing, and it's about Los Angeles, 1930s Los Angeles. And the premise is basically Los Angeles has always been brown. And it's really to pull in who we are throughout history and the founding of this great city. Um, it has fantasy elements, I was told. Um, I didn't mean to do that, it's just how I see the world. And I think that's how Black people see the world. Anyway, we walk through and amazing things happen. So I'll be reading from the opening. My name is Sarah. <clears throat> My name is Sarah Shipley and I've slept with five women. But since I married a man, no one asks the kind of persons I choose anymore. I've been married six times. All of them have been men, and all of them have been taken from me by God or by man, death in all cases. But my first husband is who I remember most. First husband was once born in 1948 and was murdered just like my third. But I wasn't surprised, devastated but not surprise, because we're all on the verge of somebody else's violence. 
It used to scare people when I'd let down my guard and confess that my husbands were murdered. They would call me cursed, not unlucky. In fact, the word unlucky would only be used by those who thought I had something to do with it because no one's that unlucky. So now when people ask how my husband's died, I say, I tell them that he stopped breathing. And for my own sake, I don't remember the faces of those who took their breath anymore. I was 40 years old when first husband died, the first time. And in every life, 40 is the age when I start losing things, you know, memories, my glasses, my friends. The frequency of their deaths make dying pedestrian, but not always. Sometimes it is life altering. It hurts me to watch the anguish of others who don't understand it's not always over, not for everybody. First husband was devastated when he lost his mother, Florence Mary Clay. She had nine kids. And in 1956, when he was eight years old, Mary walked off the cotton fields to work cleaning classrooms, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., $2 a week slave labor. But we all thought we were rich, first husband said. Mary was the first woman janitor at a school in Mississippi, preschool through high school, one school for all the Negroes. And she kept the whole school clean by herself. At lunch, she worked in the lunchroom making sandwiches for all us children, he said, serving warm plates and apples. And she never missed a day, so folks respected my mama. And on Sundays, he and his brothers would walk up Columbus Street, their skin dark as wet soil, and their new haircuts lined and shaped into something like a helmet full of black flowers. And they'd wear Sunday suits then each pressed paper hard and without crinkle or sound, hand folded around their bodies like wearing origami. Folks will point and say, those are Mary Clay's kids, and they'd make room for them. And that's how I knew about people, first husband said. Not by the way, by the way they treated me, but how they treated my mama, respected her. That's how I decided who I liked and who I didn't. The other children at school would straighten their chairs and pick up the trash before the school day ended because they knew my mama was coming. First husband was 18 years old when his mama died, 61 years of age. So at her funeral, he started counting down his own life because he was convinced he wouldn't outlive her. He counted 43 more years to make something of himself. The first thing he did was call off the wedding. You see, his girlfriend Olive was pregnant and marriage was the Christian thing to do. But since his mama was gone, they had no reason to pretend they were religious. So he moved to California and at Olive stayed in Mississippi with her family to have the baby and that was that. By the time I met first husband, he was 45 years old and had already stopped chasing the son he'd abandoned in Mississippi. He decided the best thing to do was to wait and to let his son find him when his son was ready. And every birthday that edged him closer to 61, he reminded me that he didn't have much time. He said, I know I'll die by 60 because I'm not worthy of more than what mama had. And I'd argue, I'd tell him, no one could know when his time was to die. But he said he did know. And then he proved it. First husband died at 60 years old. And I don't disagree with him anymore. Thank you. Girl, I was just getting all set it up for the rest of the story. <laughs> stopped. <laughs> I have such awe for uh, fiction writers and for novelists. Uh, first of all, you know, poem. Even if you do the long poem, it ain't a novel, girl. So I'm interested in, again, how long it took you, um, what the seed of this, and tell, tell us a little bit about the backstory of, of how this book came to be. You know, this... I've always been, so my family moved from Alabama um, just before I was born, um, but I've always heard and spent time in Alabama and I never met anyone from Birmingham or Montgomery or anywhere like that who had stayed any period of time in LA. You know, we're all pioneers here. Um, so it's always people coming in, taking what they need, finding their fame and then going home wherever that is. So we're, but we're a family who stayed um, and I was always told that I was going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. 
when my parents, ex- I call it escape the terrorism of the South. Um, so we had that kind of immigrant mentality and I became a lawyer and I was able to tell the stories of LA as a criminal defense attorney. Um, so most of my clients are people who have been convicted of crimes um, because I do what's called post-conviction relief. So I get people out of prison with clemency petitions, I erase records um, so they, they can move on without the stigma of their past. So, so much of that being LA is in me by profession. I've been an attorney for 20 years now um, and just by growing up here and, um, and having a mama who won't, wouldn't let me forget where I came from, you know, but I could still be a Valley girl. I could still be myself. So I still say, oh my God, you know, all the stuff that makes me the strange one in the room, you know, but um, yeah, so that's where it's always been there. You know, these stories, Shara was talking about history. Um, All of us, you know, we're resurrecting our ancestors and people from the past. So we get this opportunity to bring them back and breathe life into them and hold them up into a new light, a light that they didn't have the benefit to experience. Um, So I think it's always been in me, Lauren. That's the best way I can explain. Thank you. That's such a a wonderfully mystical way of saying it, which brings me to my next question, which is about genre. I feel like so much of the conversation around the novel is it's thrill. What did I see? Supernatural, thriller, folk, (laughs) sci-fi. There's all of these genre um, attachments to um, to this work. And I'm curious about your relationship as a writer to those definitions and to genre itself. Girl, Lauren, I am just black, okay? I am blackity black. That's it. That's the same. like you don't. I don't. I don't think when something strange happens, you know, and I or even growing up, when my mom was like, "Ooh, you gotta plead the blood of Jesus over that person, girl." You know, when they're talking about bad energy or or whatever, you know, it's just something that's it's. There's no difference. So mm-hmm. for me, when they call it, like, you know, fantasy is the label or science fiction. Those are labels that my publisher put on it to market it, to give it a place. Um, But to me, it's just a fiction, you know, it's it's a fictive story, it's fiction, you know, Um, but it's the way that I see the world. Um, There's no difference. Um, So, yeah, so I don't I don't push away the label because I know the business end of it, but it's not what I intended when I wrote this. So when I'm when it's being compared to Octavia Butler, I'm like, you know what, she did that. Like that was her her gift and her thing. Um, so it's always just humbling and beautiful. And I'm just black. And that <laughs> means a lot. That's a big statement. When I say just, it ain't just, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I, I just love that that idea of, of how it encompasses everything. And I'm thinking about the novel and um, all of the, the times in there and how what were some of the challenges of not letting those eras slip or having them slip? How was how was handling time as a novelist? Which I mean, right? T- novel is so much about time, and you time <laughs> you, you gnarly it up a little bit in there. Yeah, you know. So I like jumping through time because I think our story can't be told as a single moment. Mm. Um, and so many people want, are trying to force, especially Black writers, to talk about one moment in history when we're all of it. We've existed um, and we're still in a lot of our history right now. We haven't overcome things, so we're still there. So I didn't think that I could tell a story of Los Angeles without jumping through time to tell a more complete story. Um, and and I wrote... And I, the epigraph or my dedication in the book is I did it for me because my publishers were like, Oh, what's the next book? You just had this. My first book was big for them and big for me, you know? So they were like, well, your next book has to be, and I just couldn't do it. I said, I'm doing this for me. If I get one more shot, if people are going to listen to me one more time, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm going to tell us a more complete story of who we are. And that's my goal. And it'll be the same goal next time because it turns out I get another <laughs> chance. So, <laughs> still oh, here. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much. 
um, Natasha, just just lovely chatting. I'm gonna um, bring all of our finalists back up tonight, and I have one more question. I'm gonna ask all y'all to answer. So we'll bring all the spotlights onto everybody. Um, so. You know, this is the, the Hurston Wright Legacy Awards. This is the Voices of Legacy. And I'm going to ask each of you in the order that you read um, to give a writer or two, maybe three, but max, because, you know, I know you got to scroll, but that um, that you want to invoke in this space that was, uh, you know, present in the um, in the writing of the work that you're nominated for tonight. Um, Shara, who would you like to bring in? Uh... I mean, like you said, this is a high pressure question because there's so many, but I will just say Lucille Clifton, mm -hmm. um, who is always present for me and at the Walnut Grove Cemetery. That particular poem uh, really kept coming into my head while I was working on this book. Yeah. Thank you. It's like, I don't even need three. Terry. <laughs> I have to say Lucille Clifton too. And I'm now that you brought up one girl with like here lies, here lies, here lies, here. Um, yeah. Uh Lucille Clifton always, ever, forever and always, um, who just gave just opened up the doors for me to write about the things that I write about and who just whose work constantly invites my soul on a front porch for lemonade. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, I, I would I would have to shout out Nikki Giovanni because my mother taught me to read to her work. And then I'd have to shout out Rita Dove because Mother Love is always in my head, too. And just her powerful ability and what she did with the Demeter Persephone myth in that in that collection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yusef. Who are you bringing into the space? <laughs> yes, I would like to bring Robert Hayden mm. and Florence Anthony. I mm. two amazing voices, and perhaps a third one that goes way back, George Moses Harden. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And taking it home, Natasha. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna say I wanna say Lucille Clifton as well. You know, won't you celebrate with me? Mm. You know, I had no model. We're all making this shit up, excuse my language. <laughs> you know, right. but we're making it up and celebrate with me. And obviously Octavia Butler. Richard, right? The reasons that we get this privilege today, you know, every moment I try not to take it for granted. And also my mama, who never wrote a single word because she tells stories. If she tells something funny or too revealing, she ends it with, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, I'm just kidding. You know? <laughs> so for her, who never had the courage or the encouragement to put a word down, but is a brilliant storyteller. Ah. Uh. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us tonight. Thank you so much to Hurston Wright for hosting this. Um, thank you to our nominees who, whose work blessed us all tonight. I want to remind you that there are more events coming up this week and the Eventbrite link is in the chat. Do RSVP, get your seats, get your life. Uh, thank you so much everyone and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>